Hello those new to my channel and returning macabros, and welcome to the first installment in my One Fatal Flaw series. This series aims to discuss films that I argue suffer tremendously from a single writing or directing decision. That is not to say that this is the only flaw in the entire film, nor do I mean to say said flaw makes the film a complete and utter crapshoot, but rather the particular flaw significantly reduces the quality of the film and or prevents it from being far more effective and or thematically brilliant than it already may be. To begin this series, I will discuss the very film that inspired it, Denis Villeneuve's 2013 film Prisoners. The film tells the story of the abduction of two young girls, Anna and Joy. Anna's father, Keller Dover, played by Hugh Jackman, is hellbent on bringing her home safely. Detective Loki, played by Jake Gyllenhaal, finds their prime suspect, Alex Jones, played by Paul Dano. But without any compelling evidence, the police are forced to let Alex go. Convinced that Alex is the man who kidnapped his daughter, Keller kidnaps and tortures him to make him tell him where she is. Meanwhile, Loki pursues other leads and races against the clock to find the missing girls. The film was critically acclaimed, most notably for its performances and its cinematography, did pretty well at the box office, and was my own personal first exposure to director Villeneuve, who would go on to become one of the most consistently skilled directors of the decade. From a writing standpoint, what I admire so much about the film is that it proves that having some big fancy hook isn't necessary to tell an engaging story. The story's setup is deceptively simple. Two young girls go missing and must be found, and yet is immediately effective at grabbing the audience's attention and keeping it, mostly due to the excellent direction by Villeneuve and the collective A-game brought by the cast. But unfortunately, Prisoners also happens to be one of my least favorite films. Not because I think it is a bad film per se, but because the film takes what I would say is a literally perfect first act and squanders it with an insanely overblown second act and one of the most hilariously inept third acts I have ever seen. Now while it may seem that I must have a number of things I find faulty in the film for me to be so critical of it, Almost all of my reservations against the film sprout from a single writing decision that acts like a domino effect bringing down the entire film. And that fatal flaw is... So after Keller kidnaps Alex Jones, the bulk of Act 2 consists of Loki trying to find the girls. Loki ends up with a new suspect when he sees a suspicious man at a vigil for the missing girls. Loki tracks him down and discovers that the man is Bob Taylor, a young boy who went missing years previous. Loki questions Bob, assuming he must know where the girls are, but Bob grabs one of the cop's guns and kills himself. Loki is in despair, realizing that his only lead to the girls just blew his brains out. But then he comes to an epiphany. So at Bob's house, there were a bunch of maze drawings on the walls. Loki connects this to a pendant that was found on a dead man in a pedophile priest's house that he just so happened to come across earlier in the film when he was following up on leads. A rather wonderful coincidence, but I digress. Around that time, Joy, one of the missing girls, is found alive. She isn't able to tell them who kidnapped her, but does make a cryptic comment about Keller, quote unquote, being there. It is at this point that the film enters its third act, and all hell breaks loose. So Keller rushes from the hospital, seemingly having discovered where his daughter is, evading Loki and the other cops as he flees. Keller goes to the house of Alex Jones's aunt, Holly, whom he had visited earlier. Since Joy said she heard Keller's voice at some point, and Keller had earlier visited Holly, Keller puts two and two together and realizes that Holly is in fact a kidnapper. Keller plans to interrogate her to tell him where his daughter is, but Holly pulls a gun on him, and then, I shit you not, instead of just killing him, Holly marches him outside and sticks him in a hole in the ground, all the while delivering the equivalent of a supervillain monologue, basically explaining the entire plot to Keller, a man she plans to kill, just not at this exact moment. So it turns out that both Alex Jones and Bob Taylor were abducted by Holly and her husband, the man who Loki found dead in the priest's basement. They had lost their only son to cancer years previous and then set off on their so-called War on God, in which they abduct children, thus turning their parents into metaphorical demons, as they suffer from their loss. After Holly's husband was killed, she continued said war on her own. It is then revealed that the entire plot was set up, not by Holly purposefully kidnapping the two girls, or having Alex do it for her. It turns out that Alex just so happened to offer them an innocent ride, and it was only after Alex drove them to Holly's house that she decided to abduct them. So anyway, Keller is in the hole, and Holly plans to kill his daughter and throw her body down there with him just to make him suffer. Again, I'm not sure why she didn't just kill him immediately, 
but okay. After Keller flees the hospital, Loki heads to the abandoned apartment complex where he found Keller drinking earlier in the film and finds Alex Jones. Loki then heads to Holly's place to let her know Alex has been found and just so happens to see a picture of Holly's husband wearing that maze medallion he found on the corpse in the priest's basement. Loki realizes that Holly and her husband are the real kidnappers. He is able to stop Holly just before she is able to kill Anna and brings Anna to safety. The film ends with both girls safe, Holly dead, and Alex safely returned to his true parents. While canvassing the scene of the crime, Loki hears a whistle blowing, which is Keller at the bottom of the pit blowing the safety whistle that he gave to his daughter earlier in the film. The implication being that Loki will rescue Keller. So while it sounds like I find there a lot to be wrong with the film, almost all of the narrative flaws of the story sprout from the writer wanting to add this whole symbolic war on God turning parents into demons plot aspect. I would argue, outside of some on the nose symbolism, it doesn't add much to the film and distracts from the raw and simple setup of the film's first act. In the first act, things are set up pretty well. Loki must find the missing girls before Keller goes too far and kills Alex, a perfect ticking clock scenario. The problem then becomes, however, all of the setup that the writer had to feature about Loki discovering the second suspect and all the stuff about the snakes and the maze drawings and the children's clothes. This makes the second act intriguing, but also results in it dragging on for quite some time. By itself, this isn't that bad, but because the investigation plot drags on for so long, the other faction of the plot, Keller interrogating Alex Jones, drags on even more to a ridiculous degree. There are so many scenes of Keller torturing Alex that don't add anything to the plot and become tiresome and borderline exploitative. It's even worse when you consider that it's later confirmed that Alex is completely innocent. And since Keller's interrogation of Alex had nothing to do with him discovering where his daughter was, we basically saw Keller, the character we are supposed to empathize with, systematically torture a severely mentally disabled victim of child abuse for a good 60 minutes or so. I get this was done in order to support the theme of parents becoming demons after the loss of a child, but this seems like insane overkill. But the decision to add in this whole war on God, turn parents into demons symbolism not only bloats the second act, thus dragging out the already redundant torture plot, but because the second act introduces so many additional elements to the story, what with the second suspect, the clothes, the snakes, the mazes, and the child kidnapping psycho couple, it all needs to be wrapped up in the third act of the film, which is why the resolution of the story is dependent on contrivance and coincidence. Joy escaping, her hearing Keller's voice when he happened to visit Holly's place, him running off and not telling the other cops he knows where his daughter is, Holly not killing him right away and instead drugging him, and telling him the whole shebang for the sake of the audience, Loki finding Alex and going to Holly's place and seeing the maze medallion in the picture, all miraculously in less time it would have taken Keller to get to Holly's get drugged, and have Holly kill Anna. My other big gripe with the film is that because it was so focused on the symbolism and whatnot, it actually glosses over the most interesting and intriguing part of the film. What is going to happen to Keller? Keller's wife Grace does mention that she knows Keller is going to jail if he is found, but I feel like the film sort of downplays it. Keller is going to jail for sure, but it's not like they're talking about a reduced sentence by justification of him being under severe emotional distress. If he just assaulted Alex in the moment, like he does at the beginning of the film, film, that would be one thing. But no, he kidnaps and systematically tortures him for a long ass time. It's even more fucked up because Grace is all like, yeah, what Keller did was pretty messed up, but I'm okay with it because he had to do it to save our daughter. Except once again, Keller kidnapping and torturing, once again, a severely mentally disturbed victim of child abuse had absolutely nothing to do with Anna eventually being found alive. So, yeah, no, Keller is going to jail for a long ass time, and he totally deserves it. The film also sort of gleans over the fact that both Joy's mother and father knew about Keller torturing Alex and didn't do anything to stop it. I doubt Keller would rat on them, I just thought it was a bit weird that it's never really mentioned after the fact. What sucks about the film ending just before Keller is found is that they missed an opportunity to tie the ending in with the main theme of the film. After Keller is found, he will then have to face his family and tell them the horrible things he has done. Perhaps Joy's parents, while they got their daughter back, are left haunted due to what they did to Alex. In the end, Keller and Joy's parents, though they have had their daughters return to them, must now live with what they have done and deal with the repercussions. They have in effect become the demons that Holly spoke of. It sort of irked me that the film, 
which seemed to be about the moral implications of violence and the just before said moral implications could be truly explored. The decision by the writers to add in the whole war on God aspect of the plot not only seems in sharp contrast to the deceptively simple yet effective first act, but bloats the second act investigation arc to an overwhelming degree, drags on the second act kidnap slash torture arc to a near exploitative degree, and wraps it all up with a contrivance and coincidence filled third act. This is a common problem I see with a lot of films. They start off with a great first act and clear conflict, but they fall victim to the second act trap. The second act is the hardest act to crack, in most movies, as it is the longest section of the film and thus maintaining the rising action for so long is difficult. And thus one of the most common things I see movies do is introduce brand new plot developments to keep the audience's attention. However, this often leads to a jumbled narrative and a more often than not rush to third act. This also happens to be my exact problem with the film Looper, which we will discuss in the next episode of this series. In the case of Prisoners, the film had a great first act, sets up a solid second act, but instead of just working with the elements it is presented, it introduces the War on God stuff that ends up taking over the narrative. And then all of it has to be resolved in the third act, which leads to it being a bit overstuffed. It's even more of a shame in this particular case, since the film is so damn long. By that I don't mean two and a half hours is long in general, there are some two hour films I feel are too long, and some three hour films I feel are too short. Prisoners is not a story that warrants its length and most likely would have benefited from keeping it to the bare essentials. Speaking of which, I'd like to use this opportunity to show just how effective quote unquote trimming the fat of your script for you fellow writers out there can be. One of the other most common problems I see in a lot of scripts is the overabundance of unnecessary characters and or subplots that detract from the story far more than they add to it. To demonstrate, let's give the film a quick rewrite and see how much the film could have been improved had the writer trimmed the fat. So we would obviously keep the setup with Anna and Joy being kidnapped, Alex being named the suspect, then released, and Keller kidnapping and torturing him while Loki tries to locate the girls. Now as we know, the film devolves into a cluttered mess as it sets up all the War on God stuff. But what if this entire element of the plot was completely removed from the film? What if instead of Holly and her husband being the kidnappers, we just make the kidnapper this guy? Bobby Taylor, and instead of him being someone who was kidnapped as a young boy, he was just a run of the mill child abductor. It turns out that the girls were truly kidnapped by Bobby, and Alex being parked on the street at the time, and thus being labeled a suspect, was merely a tragic coincidence. Towards the end of the second act, Loki pursues Bob Taylor, and upon going to his house and being politely invited in, Loki finds Anna and Joy and brings them home. Wait a minute, so hang on. You want Loki to find the girls in the second act? But then there would be no third act. On the contrary, if Loki finds the girls at the end of the second act, then the film sets up what could have been one of the best third acts in recent memory. Anna and Joy are returned and all seems well, but Keller still has Alex. Keller can't release Alex as it may lead to him going to jail, and thus the final conflict is set up. Keller must decide between killing Alex or turning himself in and losing his family. The reason this works so well is that it turns Keller into the exact thing he was hunting. Keller is now the kidnapper of an innocent. This scenario would also be a great callback to the opening of the film, where Keller speaks to his son about being prepared to do what is necessary when shit hits the fan. In the end, the film puts Keller in the most extreme of this scenario. Is Keller willing to kill an innocent man in order to return to his family and absolve himself from the consequences of his actions? It could have made for an insanely good final conflict. However, let's make it even better simply by removing more elements from the plot. We can remove Joy and her parents entirely and just have Anna be the only one who goes missing. Joy is really only in the film because the writer needed her to escape at the end of the second act in order to kick off the third act. And as I said, her parents being involved in Alex's kidnapping goes nowhere, so we can remove them entirely as well. But also, what if we were to remove Keller's wife Grace from the narrative? She just lays around for the duration of the entire film, so it's not like her absence would be all that detrimental to the plot as it stands. However, in our rewrite scenario, removing Keller's wife from the story completely changes the narrative's final decision. So after Anna is found at the end of the second act, Keller must decide either to release Alex and most likely go to jail, or kill him and walk free. But if we remove Keller's wife from the equation, now the stakes are driven even higher. It's not just that Keller turning himself in 
would mean he would lose his family, but since he is the sole guardian of his daughter and son, if he does turn himself in, his children would have no one to look out for them and would most likely be put into the foster care system. And thus, the final conflict would be Keller deciding whether or not to kill Alex, not just because he doesn't want to go to jail, but because he knows if he does, his children will be left on their own. The writer could have handled the climax in many different ways, with the third act featuring Loki trying to find Alex before it's too late. If Keller did decide to kill Alex, what would Loki do? Would he take Keller in? Would he cover up the murder and allow him to return to his family? So much potential dramatic conflict that arises from such a simple setup. One of the most effective ways to set up a gripping finale is to put your protagonist in an impossible situation. Keller is forced to choose between killing an innocent boy or losing everything he loves. The film had the potential to set this conflict up, but unfortunately opts for an over-convoluted and contrived conclusion that glosses over Keller's moral dilemma. A shame to say the absolute least. Thank you for tuning in to the first episode of my One Fatal Flaw series. Next episode, we will discuss Ryan Johnson's 2012 sci-fi film, Looper, a truly well set up film that unfortunately falls victim to the second act trap. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already, consider supporting me on Patreon, and I'll see you next time.